youtube.com slash open up your mind 101. Peace and love, is this Dr. Africa? Yes, this is Dr. Africa. Oh, Yay. wow, thanks. Yeah, we're excited. <laughs> oh, okay. I'm excited too then. Okay. Yes. Yes. So, um, so yes, as you, can, as you all can hear, Dr. Africa is in the house. Finally, uh, we're so we're so grateful to have you here with us, and we're, we're ready to to have you drop a lot of wisdom on us in regards to using food for our medicine and any other holistic health mm-hmm. um, uh, knowledge that you can give to us. So, just for those of you who aren't here, who maybe don't know Dr. Africa, if you don't mind, uh, Baba, if I just give you a, a short introduction about who you are and um, to the to the family. Um, mm-hmm. So, Dr. Africa, he's one of the world's most famous authorities on health and nutrition. He has a doctorate in naturopathy from the Anglo-Saxon Institute in England. He is a certified addictionologist with a degree from the American College of Addictionology and Compulsive Disorders. He is a certified nurse from Georgia Baptist Medical Center, and he is also an acupuncturist, a metaphysician, and in the U.S. Army um, as a social worker, nurse, and psychotherapist. He studied to become a massage therapist, herbalist, historian, writer, lecturer, teacher, and medical astrologist. Dr. Africa has over 35 years of experience and training in ethnomedicine, which is the use of disease remedies and diagnosis based upon the biochemistry of race. Because of these tremendous credentials, he is one of the most sought-after lecturers in the country. He has also taught and studied in countries like Africa, Europe, and, of course, America. He has lectures that he gives on and workshops um, in eighty different on eighty different topics in America, in the Caribbean, in Latin America, and Europe. He's the author of several books on health and wellness, and like I mentioned, a few of them, like African Holistic Health. He has a book called Melanin: What Makes Black People Black, and Nutricide being a few of his most popular mm-hmm. writings. And he also has over eighty CDs and DVDs and books regarding various health history and nutrition topics, especially as they apply to the African community's health. So, um, so yes, yeah, so wow, Dr. Welcome. Africa, yes, so he, that's, that was a mouthful. Uh, we wanted you, we, we really wanted you to, to, to expound on just using food as medicine because it's the topic, I mean, that's the title of our show. We want to, to know just kind of first off, like how do you use food as medicine in your practice and when dealing with African people? What kind of things do you, um, how do you, do you utilize that foundational type of modality? The process is just a natural process, knowing when to eat and why you eat and how to eat and understanding that herbs are food, coriander, curry powder. We just don't think of them as food. Parsley, those are herbs. Uh, right. We call them, but they are also foods, and we don't think of them as that for some reason. So it's a matter of knowing how to combine your foods properly, which you would say herbs, what herb to put with what herb. A herb is actually right. a leaf and the stem of the plant together. That's called herbs. Then you have roots, then you have leaves, but a herb is all of those things together, technically speaking. The mm. thing is that uh, we don't have that kind of connection to the earth. We're about four generations from being farmers. Uh, originally, all of our people were in agriculture, picking cotton, sugar cane, all that sort of abusive kind of labor, but we were close to the mm-hmm. soil and to the rhythm of the earth. We don't have right. that anymore. Our connection to food is mostly in the grocery store, so we don't have that kind of spiritual sensitivity about food. But that's how mm-hmm. you use medicine, knowing when to eat, how to eat, and what to eat, and knowing how to use what you call spices, which are actually herbs to put in your food to treat whatever illness you have. You may want to add some chicken spice to your food or soup. If you have a cold, you put that in Mm. your spice is a technical term for a small measurement. So you put a small measurement of a herb in your food and you're eating it. So basically, your medicine. Mm. Wow. And I'm glad you brought up the thing about herbs and spices because I remember you did, I listened to you do, um, I think you might have talked about this too when you came out here and to Dr. Goss's property, but I've also heard you talk about how when you heat herbs, like when you put them in hot water, you heat them in food, that they actually become a drug. 
Um, oh, I don't wow. know if you remember saying that, but like it changes, like it changes. Like I think you said that it changes their their chemical properties or something. That, because now it's not just like a like a, I guess a, a plant that is just used for spicing, but now it becomes like a, a drug, like medicine drug. So. That's technically correct. Uh, if you heat up me, I'll change. I mean, it's just a process right. going to a living. <laughs> thing. Uh, when you heat it up, it's going to lose its moisture, which we call sweating when you heat up. So it changes the biochemistry of the plant, and it changes your biochemistry. And it's knowing how to, what to heat up to change its biochemicals, make up conducive to what you're trying to do. And mm-hmm. the thing is that you have to have portable kind of things. And so you dry the herbs so you can have portable medicine, because you don't have a farm anymore to grow these things fresh and grow them in season when the season's correctly for the plants. So you have to have them in a dry form so they can be accessible for you. And this, of course, is not the better form. Fresh would be better, but we have to make certain compromises because we don't have any control over this land anymore or the food mm-hmm. supply for that matter, which people call GMOs and all that stuff today. We just don't have any control. Right. Interesting. And um, yeah, oh, and I'm gonna ask, I'm, I'm gonna ask another question, Kenya. I didn't know if you were about to ask him something. Oh no, <laughs> uh, no, I was just saying that. Yeah, I was just um, agreeing with him. Yeah, with as far as the um, yeah, right, uh, yeah, yeah. So with the so with that being said about the land, like just with the organic and um, I guess inorganic kind of thing. So how? How do you feel about the inorganic and organic uh, aspect of our food? Like, do you do you recommend that we even, uh, you know, that we even entertain the organic and organic uh, labeling? Like, is or is this something that is basically not helping us? And and my and then like kind of like the second part of that question is some I've had some instructors tell me that they don't buy organic things because the the plants themselves, like if they, like say they don't buy organic kale, that the kale itself is like the fact that it has chlorophyll and you know phytonutrients and things, it'll actually help you detox the pesticides that the the kale has been sprayed with, you know. So they don't buy organic because oh well, I'm just eating the kale and the kale will help me detox it from itself, you know, kind of thing. So I don't know how you feel about that. Can you expound? Uh, actually, my grandmother was raised on organic food, but she didn't call it that. <laughs> right, right. When I, during, during a period of time, maybe in the 50s or so, most of the food was half organic anyway. We weren't even thinking about that when I was young because we were eating organic. The problem is that um, the person who says that the, the chlorophyll, whatever the nutrients the plant has, can protect it from the pesticides and herbicides, Mm-hmm. It's saying something wrong because the plant can't protect itself. That's why you have weed killers. These plants can't protect themselves from that stuff. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Right, it's exactly. Not making any. That's the emotional statement. Whenever it doesn't mm-hmm. make logical sense, it's emotional. And that person was just being emotional, covering it up with some scientific words, which is what men do. We hide our emotions with these words, and you don't see mm-hmm. us emotionally mm-hmm. up about stuff. Mm-hmm. Wow. And organic is the better way to go. It's as best as you can eat organic and as best as you can eat raw as much as possible. But mm-hmm. we have lost taste for raw food. We've lost our taste for organic food. It's, mm-hmm. Our tastes have been denatured by the denatured plants and meat that we eat. So we have denatured our ability to taste the goodness in food. Mm-hmm. Wow. That's deep. The, the um, taste buds themselves are actually fired off before you're born. That's the, one of the purpose of the amniotic fluid, you see. Mm-hmm. When it changes its viscosity, excuse me, when it changes this thinness and thickness, which you can call pH, it stimulates certain areas of taste in your body, and the lungs are loaded with taste buds, as well as your reproductive mm-hmm. system. But we just think of it as on the mm-hmm. tongue because we're isolated and fragmented because we're coming out of the European ad- analytical system. But every cell mm-hmm. can taste and smell. To survive, it has mm-hmm. to eat and smell. And right. it has to have a bowel movement, which you can call carbon dioxide, a, a gas bowel movement, or, or a solid bowel movement, which you think of. But every, every, every form of uh, elements can be a waste, the gas, as well as the minerals, as well as the water. 
All of those come in a uh, beneficial form and a waste form. You can call the water pee, but it's still a waste form of water. So everything right. you take mm-hmm. in to a waste form. But we just think of a bowel movement. I'm saying the cell itself has a bowel movement of gas and water and solids. The solids mm-hmm. is what produces the B vitamins in your intestines of the bacteria that's eating the rotten food. We just right. don't have that connection with the wholeness of the of the environment telling us the story of our bodies. We think it's in a mm-hmm. laboratory school, but nature's telling you how your body works if you just look at it, but we're too far away from the farm nowadays to, to know these things. Wow. Yeah, and that made me think about what you were talking about when you came out here um, to, to Phoenix. Um you were talking about how the body only has two ways of, of I guess, of addressing something or knowing that something's going on in the body, whether it be like a deficiency or whether it's an excess. And um, can you kind of expound on, like, the – I think you, you, that's when you were talking about, like, the bipolarness, how, like, everything, in the, everything has a, a bipolar aspect. Can you talk about that with the family, about the bipolar – the bipolarity in the body? And that. The the obvious bipolarness is a living person because they were made by their mother and father. That makes them bipolar. Mm-hmm. So we we throwing out Ooh. this term like something new is just a new word to say the same old damn thing. The merger mm-hmm. of bipolarness is you. You are a merger of your mother and father. So you by nature are bipolar. Mm-hmm. And that's the same thing happens with the plants. When the bee is busy pumping and having sex with a flower, I mean that's bipolar. Sex for the mm-hmm. plant is a bipolar. It's the bee and the plant. That's two things that makes sex bipolar. It's after a while, you say, this is absurd for me to learn these different terms to say the same thing. So we have oh. negative and positive on a battery. That's bipolar. And it's the same thing right. with magnets. That's bipolar. So someone say they have a bipolar illness. I'm saying, well, what are you saying? I, I just don't get it. It's just one of those right. non words of some emotionally bent European science. It just didn't have anything else to do. It got upset and said, let's call it bipolar. <laughs> wow. Right. Yeah. Wow. So how would you so, people? Oh, I was going to say, I know a few people that is classified as so-called bipolar. And a yeah. lot of times they can't really tell you what that is. <laughs> right. Um they have a lot of, I know, like, in the, like, they have, like, a different, in the DSM, they have a lot of different subsets of bipolar disorder. Uh, Dr. Africa, since you brought up bipolar, how would you, how would you look at a bipolar, what they call bipolar disease? Like, what is that in a holistic diagnosis approach when you look at bipolarity, I mean, bipolar disease? I'm looking at the, the change in the rhythm of the body. In the evening when you're resting, you're alkaline. During the day, you're active, you're acid. That's bipolar. So if the person has a disease yeah. in a bipolar system, the disease is going to be bipolar. This is just so no-brainer at a certain point. It just becomes ridiculous. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so the disease mm-hmm. has to be a bipolar characteristic because it's in a bipolar-made person, which is you. Uh, yes. Yeah. It becomes like, I don't know what they're talking about, frankly. And I worked in psychiatry for 15 years, and I know all them flippant terms, you know, bipolar, paranoid, schizophrenia, all that kind of stuff. Right. But mm-hmm. It's not that. It's, it's something emotionally going on with the person, and they don't understand it, and they don't have the emotional vocabulary to talk to themselves or anyone else. And the industry mm-hmm. feeds on it. That's how they sell cars lipsticks, shoes, everything coming from this emotional, which we call a female perspective. That's how they mm. manipulate the market. It's just, it's just mm. bipolar, as they would say. Yeah. But uh, I, don't, I don't know what they're talking about when they say bipolar. I yeah. Really I, yeah. I mean, I know what they say. Like, they've, they've inculcated us with the, with the lingo, and I know what, yeah. what they mean. But um, but yeah, like when you think about it, it, it all has that same root, and it doesn't make any sense why they're labeled it with all these different things. And since you brought right. that up about just like the the um, like how they use that in in Western medicine, I remember too you were talking about how about like science and how um, 
how all science has a language to it. And that is, and you know, like this Western science, it, it has a language that's very confusing. But can you talk about how, um, I guess, from an African perspective, like the language and how, like, the, about the language within a more African centered type of, uh, medicine would look like? What would it be? The process is, uh, just everything you learn, you have to, Take it through a Ma'at bath. That's a, that's a, uh, Ma'at is a kind of designer term that we have for truth and justice and balance and harmony. And we just say Ma'at yeah. to encompass all of those things. So everything that I learn, I just immediately wash it in Ma'at to find out what really is going on. So is this mm-hmm. just for the body? Is this balance for the body? Is this harmony for the body? I take it through all of those things. And that Africanizes the concept of me. So when I, I learned, like, uh, chemistry was very confusing to me until I went to Germany or whatever, and I studied with mm-hmm. this this Nazi, as you would call him, which is a socialist, and he taught me how to do certain things, and he was a guy who used to make uh, lamps and and furniture and clothing out of black people's skin. He taught me how to do all of these oh. things. We didn't have an actual oh, wow. black. It's just a matter of knowing how to chemically do the process. But nonetheless, I'm just saying that the, the languages that uh, you, what fools people is they look at these Western movies and everybody's talking this English, but the people came from France, Italy, Spain, they had different accents. So it's, it's mm-hmm. just, the Western movie is totally absurd. They should have their accents. And the slaves don't have an accent, even in the, what they call that, roots or whatever. None of them had a, mm-hmm. a Ghanaian accent or a Khan accent. This is absurd. I'm, I looked mm-hmm. at the thing, and I couldn't digest it. I washed it through my eye, and I said, no, this is not correct. This slave should have a Congolese accent. This slave should have yeah. this. And I, I washed it that way. I said, no, this. And so I had to throw out. That's why I couldn't watch roots. The whole thing, I said, no, this is not it. Mm. But everything has to go through that so you can have some clarity on what you're looking at. So I looked at the process. I say, if you got a cell, the cell has to be able to eat to survive. If it's going to eat, it has to make waste to survive. Right. And I'm washing it through my eyes. I'm saying if it's alive, it has to eat. If it's going to eat, it's going to make waste. It's going to make waste in a water form, a gas form, and a solid form. Mm-hmm. mm-hmm. After all, you say, okay, I got it. That's why they say, know thyself. I say, okay, I, I took it that way. So the whole process is when you're in a, a European environment, be it political or school or whatever they call these things, you've got to do twice as much work. <laughs> you've got to say, I'll play this little game with them and write Murray had a little lamb in scientific terms, and then I'll get back to myself and say, oh, a little girl couldn't have a lamb. <laughs> you got <laughs> you got to wash these things. So you're working twice as hard. You, in other words, you had to know how to talk BS with them and not seriously right. get involved in business. I and it, makes, it. it makes it very difficult to be a, a holistic black person in a in a school system or political system in the military, which I was in. It makes mm-hmm. it very difficult. So you you got to kind of help yourself to some kind of defense, so you don't get. Mm-hmm barbecued and torn apart and don't know yourself anymore. Mm-hmm. And it, it makes I just it just made it difficult. I, I was glad to be away from them and their foolishness actually. Yeah. But I, I was found. lucky enough to study with some people who just were crazy too. I studied with a guy from Russia when I was in the school in Italy. We were in the forest. I studied with him. I studied with some Chinese people when I was in Spain because I was on a floating campus. So I studied with some radical Chinese and white people and all that stuff. So I was kind of lucky. But I didn't know I was lucky at the time. I was very you know, irritated because I was the only black person in the class. And, and ah. they still asked to see my behind because they was taught that I had a tail in 1978. Are you serious? See my behind because the white people thought I had a tail in 1978. So uh, I think they would just maybe... I think they were just maybe like homosexuals or something. They were probably. Yeah. Well, that would make yeah. them. They were totally just being white, which is a degree of craziness anyway. It but they honestly true. thought I had a tear. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Interesting. Wow. That, that is. Wow. wow. I have a question. Um, you said something earlier about knowing what type of um, herbs 
to put together. Is there actual science to that? Because I know a lot of people just eat what they like, what's appealing to their taste versus, um, you know, putting certain things together for certain reasons. Mm-hmm. I I think it's a matter of if you have nature-specific tastes, if they were raised on breast milk and raw food, then I could trust their taste. But if they were raised on what's coming mm-hmm. out of it, trust their taste. You know? I just, just can't because the breast milk is changing its consistency during the day. It will change its vitamin and mineral content each time the baby nurses on the breast. If the baby says, I need more vitamin A, the breast milk will change. Oh, wow. This is a nutrient, this is taste bud specific, but if they didn't come that way, I don't know. If they weren't raised around their father, the smell of the father all puts the taste. So they, they, they're missing a lot of things. So I don't know if I could trust them tasting things and coming up with a conclusion. But nonetheless, that's in the called the doctrine of signatures where mm-hmm. we believe that written on the plant what it can do for you. And it's a matter of knowing the plant's language, like George Washington Carver or someone, just knowing how the plant talks to you and the secret life of plants, which is a book. And it teaches you to know the language yeah. of the, and the language right. of the minerals, because each mineral is emotional. They have tested this. Minerals get tired, they get upset, and they say, I ain't working today. I'm doing that. You need to know that. And that's in the secret. Wow. Of the, so everything is having this emotional temperament. And and being connected to the emotions of the plant is a takes you right into the vocabulary of the plant because emotions bypass Chinese, Japanese, Swahili. You can look at someone and they acting like this way or that way. You say, oh, they upset. You bypass that right. whole language, and that's emotions you know. get for you. And that's what I'm talking about. You can bypass all of that stuff and can connect with the plant and the soil. Mm-hmm. Mm. Wow, that's interesting. That's interesting. interesting. Especially with the whole, a lot of our people you hear going around, especially the weather's not to just pick on them, talking about how we are, you know, we are, we're not to be in our emotions. And to me, emotions is in everything. You have to be, you have to be emotional. I don't see a way, any way around it. Um, right. But yeah, so for that's you to say that the not. plant, Right. So to say that the plants are emotional, that's just bringing things to a whole different light for me in particular. It's making me look at things differently. Wow. I didn't know yeah, that. The Secret Life of Plants. It's, it's a book. And Stevie Wonder did the music for the movie, as a matter of fact. Yeah. I watched yeah. that. Yeah. But nonetheless, like they're just looking for female emotionalism. If it's not expressed in female form, they say it's not emotional. So that's mm-hmm. one side. Emotions are bipolar. So they're just looking at the okay, female expression. That's all. These guys are very okay. emotional. It's nothing more emotional than basketball and football, please. They get all up, <laughs> oh. every scream, holler, and all kind of foolishness. They're very emotional. Wow. Right. That's so true. That's, that's true. Wow. That's true. And since <laughs> you're talking about, like, oh, go ahead, Dr. Asker. I was just saying it's just a matter of they just saying only type of emotion is female emotion. If you don't have that, you're not emotional. That's a con mm-hmm. game right. for women, and it works quite well. Wow. Yeah, it does. It, does. <laughs> it, can, help, it can help you scare some people, too. Like, Mm-mm, don't mess with me today. <laughs> 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 it's that time. It's that emotional time. Mm-hmm. But, um, but even that, I guess, is an imbalance, too, if it's. If if you are like PMS and all that kind of stuff that scares people sometimes, <laughs> that's a, that's an emotional imbalance, you know. So, uh, but since we're talking about um, the like the science of combining like those kind of uh, those minerals and vitamins with um, different emotions, how do you feel about food combining? Like, is there um, a science with food combining too? And do you deal with food combining when you uh, practice? Uh, yes, uh, you got to keep it rather uh, simple. You don't want to go into a whole lot of technical stuff. It's just a matter right. of not uh, the basic thing is not to add sweet things and non-sweet things. Uh, putting like uh, strawberries and grapes on some wheat. I mean that's mm. illogical. You just 
bland tasting things go with bland tasting things, and bitter goes mm. with bitter, and sweet goes with sweet. Uh, starch doesn't go with meat, and meat uh, doesn't go with starch. Just keeping it simple. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but you can mm-hmm. add starch to the green leafy vegetables, and you can add meat to green leafy vegetables. That's the major thing. But you don't want to add mm-hmm. potatoes to meat. Uh, that's a illogical food combination. But that's yeah. better known as yeah. burger. So, they, they so no meat and in- potatoes? No meat and potatoes for people? Like that? <laughs> so that's, that's incorrect? Uh, starch doesn't go with meat, unfortunately. <laughs> so that's and no bur- hamburgers. <laughs> that's, that's, that's starch, which is the the bun or bread, and the meat right. that doesn't go together. If they put it on cabbage leaves or spinach leaves yeah. or kale, fine. But uh, I don't think the average no grow is going to do that. But that would right. be that. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Uh, and since, you know, we're talking about just like a, a my eye, we're washing our diet with my eye. Let's say that, you know, we're we're living a diet in my eye. What uh, can you tell, can you share with the family, like what a an African, a traditional African diet looks like? Like what kind of things did we eat or what kind of things are best for the African body to eat in regards to our traditional uh, nutritional needs and things? It's just a matter of understanding that we taught other people to eat, and they're copying what we taught them. <laughs> so be clear mm-hmm. on right, right. They're just copying what we taught them <laughs> mm-hmm. in their own mm-hmm. way. So, but nonetheless, we didn't have cow's milk or goat's milk or camel milk. Uh, we didn't have that unless we were forced to do that in a desert situation. Mm-hmm. And we didn't have salt on the table or a bowl of white sugar on the table. Those things mm-hmm. are verified in all the paintings of the pyramids. So we know that those are not part of our diet. This synthetic substance called white sugar and this thing called table salt. And the frying pan has never been discovered in Africa, so we know that's not in our diet. <laughs> Basic stuff Uh-oh. learned from the Europeans, frying food, frying bananas, and all kind of weird stuff. And it's, <laughs> yeah. it's just weird. Uh, the, the, the sun fries the food, and we don't have what? to duplicate God. I mean, God did a good job of frying the banana until it's brown or black. Now it's ready to eat. But Dr. Sun. Africa, like all the Nigerians I know fry plantain when I grew up. Where did that come from? It comes from being colonized. <laughs> wow. You have to remember the yeah. Europeans were in the, Africa 2,000 years before they brought us over here. Mm-hmm. The white Arabs and the white Chinese, that's the northern Chinese, and the white East Indians, that's the northern East Indians. They were mm-hmm. in the slave trade, and unfortunately, they they followed a colonized diet because there's no such thing as Nigeria and Algeria or Zambique mm-hmm. on any ancient map. That's some stuff some white people drew on the on Africa, just like they drew Kentucky and Mississippi on North America, which didn't exist when American Indians were here, as you know. So all these names mm-hmm. they give in these countries that they say they're from, it's not true. Some white people drew that stuff on the map. Mm-hmm. Right. So they, they wow. use a mentality, and they don't know it because they are not into the history that much. They think because they speak an African language, they know African history. It's like if I talk like a New Yorker, I know New York history. That's not true. You got to go to a historian to know New York history. They just assume because they speak an African language that they know African history, and it's not true. It's not true. Mm. You you talk with a northern accent don't mean you know Boston's history. (laughs) Give me a break. It's just that we have been miseducated, as Carter G. Woodson said over and over again, and they laughed at him for saying it when he was alive. We have been miseducated, and we need a day to try to clean up this mess, which he called Negro History Day, but it didn't work too well. Now we've got a whole month to yeah. clean up, but we can't clean it up because we don't have people using my art in the science and the chemistry and the biology and the, and the cytology and all these other branches of science. Hmm. Mm-hmm. Wow. Wow. That's, that's interesting. Um I I know I heard you uh, well. You know, I'm familiar with some of your uh, work, some of your lectures. 
And I did run across this lecture of you speaking about um, homosexuality, and you were speaking about that can help people um, that they can eat or eliminate that will help them with this. I know this is food for medicine, and I wanted to just because I thought it was very interesting that you brought food into the, the, um, that conversation. Can you just touch on that a bit? Well, what we're doing is changing the chemistry of a person, and when you change the chemistry, you're basically changing their diet, and you can change the person's mm-hmm. diet by giving them Tylenol. That's a change in their diet. Or giving them alcohol to drink, that's a change in their diet. Or putting the chemical mm-hmm. directly into their veins, which is a change in their diet. But we don't see dietary change being done in traditional medicine. We think it's just with the food. But everybody's changing right. the diet. So if I change the diet and put synthetic hormones in this person to such a level, I can alter their, their, their biochemistry, which alters the biochemistry of the brain. And I also took away the whole natural birthing process. And we are looking at the results of the hospital birthing process, which we don't count. Mm-hmm. We've given mm-hmm. this oxytocin, which causes his historical amnesia. It dis- disconnects you from mm-hmm. your source. And we're not looking at the birthing process, especially with the drugs. Once you right. yeah. to the lady, that goes into the baby, and that alters the baby's ability to think, and they get confusion, and they get obsessive-compulsive behavior because they obsessively want to find their mother and their father. Mm-hmm. Develop this obsessive-compulsive behavior and since they are subjected to this, um, these imaging machines, which you call computers, which stimulate the lower part of your brain, which it would, uh, I don't want to get too physiological here, uh, it stimulates the imaging part of your brain and not the part of your brain that says this is not morally correct. Imaging mm-hmm. machines do that. It's like I lift weights with, by only using my right arm, so my right arm is going to get bigger than my left arm. So I'm constantly using an imaging machine, which stimulates the imaging part of my brain, and the part of my brain that says this is not morally correct gets small. Hmm. So we have had, we have a new brain. This is physiology. In 1980, basically the brain changed totally. We have a new brain that deals with images and not deals with the morality or the ma'at of an idea or thought. So we have to talk to this brain differently than talking to the brain of 1950 or 1960. And, and not only that, we have altered the brain to such a process that it becomes addicted to this chemical made by the imaging machine because vision turns into a liquid to get to the brain. So we have caused an addiction to this imaging machine where the person can't get off of it. Because we're not associating the chemical made from looking at something and the chemical made from listening to something. So we have a person addicted to an imaging machine and the whole process. So now they're addicted to the disconnect with their nature, Mm. which is a disconnect to their mother, which is a disconnect to their father, which is a disconnect to their culture. So Mm. they're addicted to this disconnect. Mm. And they're just expressing this disconnect in their sexual behavior, just as someone who's angry, upset, going to disconnect from their proper diet. They probably eat a lot of sweets. So they have a dietary disconnect. We see that as visual, but they also have, a, you have an emotional disconnect and a visual disconnect where the person becomes addicted to violence or some shooting and fussing and fighting and these, these little games they play on the computer. They are addicted to it, and they become addicted to their disconnect, which some people would call the Stockholm Syndrome. Where you become mm-hmm. a, a master. So they become wow. the, to this distorted logic and this distorted emotions and thought process. And they know physiologically that there's no sex glands in no man's ass behind. So there's no sexual function for the asshole of a man. They know that right. physiologically. But I, I got them addicted wow. to a, a disconnect. So me just explaining physiology to them, say, see, a bowel movement comes out of this hole here, and that's what it's for. No penis right. goes in this hole here. Uh, right. So they don't grasp this idea. Basic physiology. Right. I've never seen two bulls married to each other in my life or two okay. roosters. I don't see this in nature, but if I feed them a certain way and cause them to behave a certain way in the concentration camps, what we call a ghetto, mm-hmm. I can 
anything I want. Mm-hmm. Wow. Wow. That was deep. That, 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 that is that deep. Right wow. Now, is there a wow. way to kind of uh, eliminate certain... Because I, I know there's a lot of, especially those, are, especially in the urban area where I grew up, uh, the so-called ghetto, as, um, you know, there's the, the, the way that we eat in those areas and you see that there's a lot of um, homosexuality amongst the, the children, the younger people, boys, girls. Is there? Do you think that food is um, has played a role in that at all? Chemistry is always playing a role in it. Always. Okay. There you go. It's okay. People in Red Bull going to school. I mean, they alternate chemicals going to school. Now with marijuana legal, okay. they alternate chemistry. When I taught a class in California, I think it was about four years ago, the children went on a break, and they were outside smoking marijuana because they had a medical prescription for it. So oh, wow. when they came mm-hmm. back to the classroom, it was just, what the hell am I talking for? <laughs> they right. weren't there. They were just disconnected. It's, all of these chemicals are floating in the system, and it's nothing more chemicalized than marijuana because they got to grow this stuff fast so they can sell it fast, so they have altered that whole thing. Marijuana today mm. is just another freak, GMO, mm. everything. But they're not looking at it. No one that says, I'm only going to smoke no organic marijuana. Please, <laughs> give me a break. <laughs> so they, they just saturate yes. themselves with chemicals on so many different levels, synthetic chemicals that is through the bread, bull, the sodas, the synthetic yes, estrogen, and the, and the hamburgers, and the marijuana, and the cigarettes, and the alcohol. It's just... It's a chemical madness. Yes. Wow. And I know um, since you talked about the just like the the link between like homosexuality in our communities with with all these chemicals in our foods. I mean, I'm sure then that you can uh, link it to just the the crime and the uh, just the dysfunctional behavior that a lot of times we have uh, between each other in our communities as well. Um, I think you talked about that in Nutricide, and I think I've heard you do a lecture on that. But is that true that, like, this is the same the same reason why we see a lot of dysfunction in general, like, with our relationships with each other, um, Dr. Africa? It's an outward expression of the inability to have a healthy relationship with oneself. It mm-hmm. starts there. And so you can't have a healthy relationship with someone else that you don't have even with your own self. This is mm-hmm. far beyond everything else. So they're just, that's an outward expression of the dysfunctionality inside the person that they have failed mm-hmm. to connect with themselves. And they don't like to be by themselves at any time. So they're constantly got an iPod or something in their ear or something in their face. They constantly don't have a connection to themselves. And if one moment of silence is called boring, <laughs> they don't mm-hmm. uh, meditate or get in, go inward to find your outward self. That is not in their vocabulary, not whatsoever. So we have to understand that the the black people watch Jerry Springer and all these little dysfunctional shows, uh, Atlanta Housewives, more than anyone else. We spend more hours watching dysfunctional shows because alcoholics like to be around alcoholics, crackheads want to be around crackheads, and dysfunctional Mm. people want to be around dysfunctional people. And that's what they want to see on TV, something dysfunctional, so to make themselves feel normal. But the problem is that we have a slave mentality. We haven't overcome our slave behavior and, and the way we treat each other. We don't really connect to each other because if you got too close to your sister and then she was sold and whipped the next day, you would just be infuriated, and, she, and she was killed, you were constantly, you know, your mother's murdered, you were constantly grieving every day because your uncle was killed or your mother was sold. So we don't get too close because we don't want to go through that painful experience of grieving and not being able to help the person that's being injured. So we don't really get in love. We use a slave's version of it because we don't invest that much of ourselves in the other person because we don't want to get hurt. This is called post-traumatic mm-hmm. slavery trauma. It's not yeah. that the person intentionally. It's just that we don't 
We don't. We look at each other like the slave master did. He looked at the, how you built, looked at your behind, looked at your breasts, and that's how we look at women, the black men, because we mimic the white slave master. Wow. So that's what we, mm. like like we're trying to sell a lady on the auction block or something. Uh, she sure is fine, yeah. Because you want to go with someone that has a high value. You want you you want to go with Tomalina because she's only worth two hundred dollars. You want to go with the slave uh, Haley Berry because worth a thousand dollars. So you want to go with the high price you call the trophy today, which, mm. which is basically the high selling slave. So we use a slave wow. mentality to look at each other, and we use a slave mentality to love each other. We. We don't really get that close uh, like we should. We don't trust the people that live on the east side of town. We don't trust the people that's on Mr. Johnson's plantation. So we're bringing that slave mentality into our love life and into raising our children because our children are evil and they're bad, so we got to beat the hell out of them. And that's what we tell them. I'm going to beat the hell out of you. Like they're yeah. evil or something. <laughs> we learned that from the slave bastard. We just keep going yeah. process. Wow. wow. So, Dr. That's Africa, as, so both of us who are are practitioners, who are healers, who are naturopaths and things like that, what what do you recommend that we should be doing? Like on our end of things, dealing with health and wellness and healing, what kind of things should we be doing in our communities in order for us to come out of this? Because it seems like, you know, it, it just seems like there's so many different ways you could go about addressing it. But how do we how do we do something about it in our community using our to do this? Well, you're accepting the fact that you're only one person, and you're accepting mm-hmm. the fact that you are not the village, so you can't hear all of this stuff that's going on in our community. Uh, right. I stay on the medical side as much as possible, although I used to do history lectures with Ben Yakanam, Henry Clark, Van Sertiman, and all those people, and I, I do the mm-hmm. history, but I try to stay on the medical side because that's the side where we're missing the most help. And when I did yeah. have practice in the, in Atlanta, um, I was every Wednesday I would do classes for my um uh, Clients and they could bring their mother and brother, anybody they want to the class. So I would do that and and I would do like an outreach program. I had one price for white people and one price for black people. And I call that outreach program I had for black people. And uh, Mm -hmm. at one price for people that were on welfare and all that kind of stuff. So I had different sliding scales, as they would call it. But the people who could pay, I made them pay. And so mm-hmm. I had outreach and the regular paying customers. And I wasn't, since I, I was doing the healing, and I am a healer, I didn't deny treating anyone. Someone could come with someone white. If they're sick, mm-hmm. I have to treat them because that's, that's what I'm a healer. So mm-hmm. uh, Chinese would come to me and American Indians and that sort of thing. So I would work with them because I'm a healer in my office. But once I step outside of my office, it's a different story, you see. So nonetheless, yeah. mm-hmm. I had my outreach, and I did little things like uh, giving little talks at churches and synagogues and mosques. And I went to health spas, as you call them, and gave talks at the gym. And mm-hmm. I volunteered and gave a talk at the public schools. I would go in there for the nutrition class and things of that sort. But mostly, um, I listened to the community, and they guided me. Not that they were saying, you need to do this, need to. They would tell me things like, you know, as senior citizens, we we having problems with this and that. And I said, oh, yeah, and I would design a little program and go to the senior citizen building. Because I was okay. listening, keeping your ear to the ground, as they say. But I wasn't trying to do everything because I spent 15 years in psychotherapy as a therapist, and I wasn't doing any psychotherapy on nobody. And I mm-hmm. used to have to hypnotize people when I worked at the for the psychiatrist at a medical college of the medical center, or whatever in Georgia. He was a hypnotist, so I had to hypnotize people for about two years, groups and single people, and I had to do that every day. And it was a thing. So when I got out of that business, I just let it go, and I just concentrated on getting the proper bowel moving out of these Negroes and trying to get them to eat more um, 
fiber, even if they had to get flaxseed meal or chia seed, and I tell them to carry it with them. So you know when you eat the pizza, you got to take at least four tablespoons of flax seeds or chia seeds or vinegar seeds, and I got to do this self-defense kind of thing. Mm-hmm. Uh, that was basic. Um, I wasn't as strict as my wife is. She's a naturopath, but I was never strict like her. I would not say, look, you don't like the taste of brown rice, so can you mix the white rice with the brown rice? And they say, yeah, mm-hmm. I can do. And I would go slow with them. Because I know how difficult okay. it is to give a, give up these little bad habits that people have. They they want right. they want to change, but they don't want to be uncomfortable while they're changing. So I try to make them comfortable mm-hmm. when they change. You don't want to scare them away and say you got to stop eating all that fried foods. Uh, right. Just reduce the frying time. Reduce the boiling time on their greens. Tell her I could get them to a steaming basket. I wouldn't. I say one day you're going to do steaming the vegetables. The next day you can boil them for two years with a pig foot. I don't care. That's your day. <laughs> but I, I, would, I would say you steam this day, boil the next day, like that. Bake this day, fry the next day, and I would okay. go slow with them because I realized they were mentally ill too, <laughs> on top of everything. Right. Well, I was very gentle with them. Mm-hmm. Okay. Wow. So it just seems like uh like you're fo- like we're focusing pretty much in our communities on like education. Education and like being accessible to people. Um, you know, not, you know, charging them out the yin yang or working with them when it comes to to your compensation and then like um and then also kind of working with them it with the with their lifestyle and dietary changes. That's what it sounds like. That was that was the synopsis of what I got from that. So, okay. So they they like that little title. I I probably I I know I went to school just to get the title just so black people would come to me. But I don't I don't use that <laughs> white face at all. I'm just telling you the bloody truth. Uh, but I say I better get this little shingle so I can hang out on my door and they say oh he's a doctor I can go see him that kind of thing. So for the first yeah. two years I work with white naturopaths in their office, and I rented office space with white naturopaths. Mm-hmm. That's what I did. So mm-hmm. the black people say, oh, yeah, he, he must be something. Know what he's doing. He worked with white people. You know, whatever. Wow. So I, I for a couple of years. Eh. But I mostly work with the American Indian naturopath. He he was very nice to me. And most mm-hmm. of the black people went to him. He had more black clients than I myself. <laughs> Like Gary Knoll in New York, most of the people in natural medicine go to him rather than the black practitioners in New York. Uh, Gary Knoll is a, a little Jewish fellow, best-selling book and all that sort of rut. Wow. So they, they will own the market. That's a, no doubt about it. And mm. They don't they own the market. The Chinese own the acupuncture market, even though I do it. But they don't never ask the Chinese, where'd you go to school at, who taught you, and all that stuff. They don't need any qualification at all except some slant eyes and say they're accurate. <laughs> and that's wow. all they do. I don't know what the hell they do. Wow. But they get most of the black customers in acupuncture. I can tell you that. <laughs> right. That's true. Yeah, mm-hmm. and I, I don't have to do that also. So I'm probably, I'm going to use acupuncture a lot. And just, I like, um, and I don't know if you, and I know you use the other aspects of what they call, I don't know, um, traditional Chinese medicine. That's what they call it, you know. But, um, like, I just think that it is more of a, I like using it because it's like, it's a lot more of a, a holistic approach in, in regards to that. It also deals with, like, energetic imbalances in the body as well. Um, and I, and that kind of brings me to what I was going to ask you about. I know that you, you just wrote a, a new book, and I wanted you to, to talk to the family, the Dynasty family, about the new book that you wrote. Um, and and can you tell us a little bit about what it uh, what it's going to, what kind of information it's going to provide as well? Uh, the book is titled Holistic Self-Diagnosis. Mm-hmm. I basically wrote the book about 15 years ago. Um, okay. The problem was getting the illustrations because uh, the artists charge a lot of money to draw things, and that was my major problem with the process. And until I sat down with a pen and started drawing all that stuff myself, 
and I was very rusty with my illustrations because I hadn't drawn anything since I was in high school when I used to draw portraits of people and all that sort of right. I was an art major. So nonetheless, the book Holistic Self-Diagnosis teaches people the skills that the Chinese use, the Japanese use, American Indians use, and the, our African ancestors, what they were doing to access the person's health before these labs opened up with the blood tests and all that sort of stuff. So I use their system to look at the eyes, which people would call today acupuncture meridians in the eyes and on the teeth and on the tongue and on the ears and on the eyelashes, the eyebrows. So I'm looking at the whole system and letting it speak to me because each system has a way of saying when something is wrong. The eyes have a way to say there's something wrong with my kidneys. The, eyes have, the lips have a way of saying there's something wrong with my liver. And so I would go to each part of the body and say, how do you speak to me? And mm -hmm. through the illustrations in the book to show what the liver is saying when there's something wrong with the lungs or something wrong with the reproductive system in the eyes and on the lips and on the ears and the fingernails, the neck. I go through each part of the body to use as a diagnosing tool. But the illustrations help bring it out more because you can actually see where the, how the tongue is going to look if certain there's some problem with the kidneys or lungs or intestines or something like that. You can actually see it. I do the illustrations for all of those. It's a self-help empowerment thing because everyone should have a healer in their family. I, I, don't, I don't mean they're going to be an expert like you. you got the, the skills. You went to school. But they should have some sort of way to know, hey, I need some help here. I better go to go to you. <laughs> that sort of yeah. thing. And they can take care of minor things. I mean, you, people can take care of scratch on a child, stuff like that. They don't need to go to a surgeon. And so I'm right. saying they can take <laughs> minor things if they have the the skills. So when something major comes up, then they come to you. But they can do a scratch. I mean, God, they don't have to go to the surgeon for that. And right. so I'm saying, the kidney's going bad. They say, well, I better get something for my kidneys. And then some things are out of their range. They say, I better go on in and see you. <laughs> You're the naturopath. That sort of thing. Right. So I was just saying some some things we should just know. We should do, know how to handle a baby that's constipated. Certain things we should just know that we don't know right. anymore. Grandmother's gone with all that information. Plus, we were calling her stupid anyway. That old-time stuff you talking about. So we, mm. we were pushing the information away anyway. So it was a problem. The book is holistic wow. diagnosis, and it teaches you those basic skills you need to know when there's something wrong with you. And when it's out of your range, you know where to go. But certain wow. things you know. Mm -hmm. Wow. And where can, um, where can people get that book? Oh, go ahead. Yeah, that was my question. That uh, was my question. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah, laelaafrica.com. Uh, they can go to my site, laelaafrica.com, or they can email me, laelaafrica at juno.com. Uh, my name has a lot of L's in it. It's L-L-A-I-L-A, -L -L -A, then it's A-F-R-I-K-A at juno, and it's laelaafrica.com, and you just pluck in health diagnosis and it'll take you through the site and calculate the costs and everything. Yeah. It's just accessible. I just try to do something and make it accessible to people because we need some help. We're in bad Yeah, yeah it's serious business. Yeah. We, well, we, um, we do have a, yes, and we do have a couple of callers I was going to say that's been holding on for a really long time. Um, if you want to go ahead and take some of us, just a couple. We do have about 10 minutes left in the show. So um, is that okay with you, Dr. Africa? Oh, yeah, that's, that's fine. If I need some help, you can take over. Really, I don't have to do all this talking. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, I do have an area called 407. What's your name and where are you calling from? Hello. Good afternoon. My name is Lily. I'm calling from Orlando, Florida. How are you? Oh, peace and love. Peace and love. How are you, sis? Pretty good. Pretty good. Hello, Dr. Africa. Um, Hello, there. Watch. Hi. I've watched um, a lot of your videos, and I also um, was in touch with your assistant around, like, June of this year, and she helped me with some other things. That was but my wife, Dr. Stevenson. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I, wife. Sure. I think, 
Yeah. yeah, I know the voicemail said she she was your assistant, so I didn't. I wasn't really sure, so I just left. Yeah, it. yeah, that's uh, <laughs> we keep professional. I talk to Steven. Yeah, yeah, she was, she was very helpful. Um, okay. I had I was on the phone with her for a little while. She helped me with some spiritual things. I wanted some clarity on, but mm-hmm. um, I have a question. I watched some of your videos about um, fibroids. Mm-hmm. And I went to the store, and I got all the herbs that you mentioned. But I've I've tried it. Basically, I've tried different things. I don't know if it's because I'm impatient, but nothing is working for me right now. And I'm at the point where they're telling me that I might have to get a hysterectomy, and I don't want to oh, do no. that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's a universal problem with black ladies. About 70% of the black ladies in the world have the fibroid tumors. Uh, I do sell a supplement for fibroid tumors that will shrink it down for you. You have to go to my email, lailaafricajuno.com, and you can get the supplement to shrink it down. And in severe kind of cases, you can do uh, take the, the herbs out of the capsule and mix it with some cocoa butter in it and form it into a suppository and insert it at night. You can actually take it right to the area. And, of course, mm-hmm. there are other things you can do, but it's a matter of you emailing me and connecting with me so I can walk you through the process. Because you have okay. to change your diet, too, and get away from the synthetic estrogen, which is actually a part mm-hmm. of the tarot, because they work together. Your tarot, t- okay, tarot. yeah, I've tried... I stopped, meat. I, I stopped eating meat. I stop eating all meats and um, what else? The sugar and the caffeine. I, I'm still on the caffeine because I drink tea or and coffee in the morning. I haven't found a replacement for that. Um, but I I want to take care of it. I don't want to you know get a hysterectomy. I mean that's over the top, and I do believe you know I it can be healed. Naturally, so I will definitely get in touch with you. Yes, yeah, so I have a, a capsule. I've put together some herbs and vitamins and minerals, and amino acids to treat the uh, fibroids. So you'll be all right. And I have to get you off the coffee, and that's not yeah. a, a one-step process. You have to get that pretend coffee from the health food store and mix it with okay. your regular coffee. Mm-hmm. Then you oh, have to okay. process until you come off of it. It's like one third pretend coffee, two thirds real coffee, and then you increase the dosage of the uh, pretend coffee. I think it's called Pyro. It's quite a few brands of it, but you're mixing them both together until you get off of it. We titrate it, reducing the dosage. You, you can come off the coffee. It, it's a good stimulant in, in its place, but uh, right now we don't need that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay, so um, just email you to. Yeah, Laila Africa at Juno dot com. At Gmail dot com. June, like the month June O. Oh, June. J U N O June O. J U N O dot com. Okay. You have it. Yes, I have it. Thank you so much. I will be doing that. Yeah. We'll okay, work thank guys. You doing a good job. Thank you. Okay, wow, that was a good call. So we're going to go to the next mm-hmm. caller, caller um, 410. What's your name and where you're calling from? Hello. Yes, Can Keith, you hear me? What's your name? How you doing, yes, Dr. I- Africa? How you doing, hostesses? Oh, That's Keith. fine. Keith okay, two things. Uh, Dr. Africa, I was uh, introduced to acupuncture about 30 years ago. Uh, I live in Baltimore. And uh, Johns Hopkins told me um, that I had the thyroid uh, problem, like the cysts that just called then spoke of. And they wanted to do a hysterectomy. I decided I didn't want to do the hysterectomy because I knew there had to be something better than to cut me. So I went to Bruce Marshall, and um, I was cured. The, mm-hmm. act- the actor puncher just took it away. Um, Mm -hmm. And the reason I did that was because Johns Hopkins had done an operation on me when I was 29 for my gallbladder. 
I found out that I didn't have to have it, and I still live with this ugly scar to date. And uh, I found out later that um, as I had ate, eaten correctly, I wouldn't have had to undergone that. I was in Johns Hopkins last week with my 72-year-old aunt who um, you can see she's losing nutrients, and they want to do an operation on her for her gallbladder because they say she has um, a mass uh, in that area. And I'm, like, really perplexed, and I'm, like, fighting against this. Could you give me a suggestion? I'm going to stop talking. Yes, the the problem is that we got to reduce that mass, and that's the uh, assistant tumor formula that I use for fibroid tumors. She would need that, so you email me at lyelaafrica at juno dot com. Um, yes, the liver is supposed to get rid of the waste in the system, and it's being impaired, so the waste is staying in system. So we got to bring the liver up to a healthy state. And so it can enjoy in the fight. And usually black people express stress through their kidneys first and their heart second. What I'm saying is the high blood pressure comes to the kidneys first and then it goes to the heart. So we have to also treat her the, her kidneys so the kidneys can read the waste in the, in the, in the blood and get rid of it. So okay. she would not need something for her liver and her kidneys and something to shrink the mass in the liver. But uh, she can be helped. It's not a problem. It's just, and I do use the acupuncture with the fibroids. It's a matter of forming what you would call an upside-down pyramid uh, below the navel. You're just going through the, the I don't want to get too medical. <laughs> You're just going well, through I the, went through it, and it, and it does work, the acupuncture, just, three months. I teach it took. The ladies how to do that with the, with, but I don't use the needles. I use another uh, grains, kind of magnetic grains that they use across the pelvic girdle area, which you call the hip bone, and we form a B over top of the uh, navel and a B below it and go down the side of the thighs. But I, that, that has to be taught. And I'm saying mm. taught the person can do this themselves and don't have to go to the acupuncture. That's what I'm trying to say. I teach okay. you how to do it yourself. You don't mm. go to that. It's not a, not a problem. It's just a matter of being having information accessible to you. I don't think I'll be in Baltimore. I know I'll be in New Jersey and New York. Oh, uh, do you? I may do come you have through. a schedule, yeah, because I know that you're here with Jabari a lot. Yeah, and I'm, because, I'm my, always missing I, you. <laughs> my brother's there, so I come through Baltimore to see him. Mm-hmm. But he got messed up in the war. He has cancer and everything else, prostate cancer and everything. His kidney's gone and everything else, but that's in his mm. medical, his United States military medical records that the, that the military caused that to happen to him. So, but uh, whatever. So I go and, and see him. Okay, wow. Sis. Well, thank Great. you for calling. Do you, you have his um, e- email information? You can always um, email Dr. Africa. Oh, I will and be. I have... will be because uh, Bruce Marshall is now in um, Hawaii. He's living in Hawaii, and um, I have to get somebody that's local yeah. for my concerns. Hey, just email me, and uh, we'll, we'll connect because i got to come through there and see my brother and whatever. And uh show you how to do that sort of thing. And I appreciate hey. you. Thank All you. All right. God bless. Wow. Uh, well, uh, we do appreciate you coming, Dr. Africa. You're going to have to join us again. Um, those yes. of you who are listening, yes, I mean, he just brought so much information in this short time. So we're going to have to ask you to come back if you, you know you can. And, Dr. Africa, can you um, give us your email again just for those who may not okay. have gotten it and also your web, your web, web um, address? Uh, my email is L-L-A-I-L-A-A-F, as in Frank, R-I-K-A at J-U-N-O.com. And to get my book, uh, Holistic Self-Diagnosing, you can go to my mm-hmm. site, which is L-L-A-I-L-A-A, as in Frank, R-I-K-A dot com forward slash health diagnosis. And that'll take you to get in the book so you can diagnose these things and get my book, African Holistic Health, and you can treat it. Open up.
Your Mind 101.